Hey there. So this week in preparation for the first novel that we're going to read with class, I'd like to go back and look at what we've done for the past two weeks in the literature course. You have been reading some introductory material and one example of this literary movement called realism. And really it is the beginning of the second course in American literature. American literature part two starts with the end of the Civil War. And we briefly at the beginning of class looked at how the Civil War had such a powerful impact on the rise of literature and realism. So we uh, looked at photos of the Civil War and we talked about the rise of journalism and descriptive language to describe the, the carnage of the war. Um, and how photography captured like what was seen as like a, a real view of the war. Well, so with the reading that you did this past week and also the story that you read, A Mystery of Heroism, um, what we see is writers sort of philosophizing about what realism is and then the backlash about what realism can't do. So if you think about how with, you know, Instagram, for example, people will take these shots that are very much, you know, the, the frame is very close up and it gives this stylized view of life. So then there's this app called Be Real and Be Real is like, just, you know, take a picture of whatever you're doing right at this moment so that you can be real. And that is acknowledging the fact that though people may have believed in you know, the Civil War, and possibly so because of the nature of photography at the time where you had to sit still and, and, and have the shutter exposed you know, for several seconds, maybe it was more capturing reality as it was um, in those days. But we know today that photography can be manipulated as much as you know a verbal story can be manipulated. You can put filters on it, you can frame it, um, crop it, uh, you can stage it, you can Photoshop it. We know that that photograph is not reality anymore. And the people who were writing in the 1880s and 1890s, they were getting that point too. So the reading that I had you do um, last week, that's what you can see right here, this reading that you had uh, to do last week. You noticed that there were people who believed that um, true realism would capture the stories of everybody. So that's why there was such an emphasis on uh, capturing the dialects of regions of America, like uh, Mark Twain was doing, and um, some of the other writers, uh, Bret Hart was doing that with Midwest. Uh, they were trying to capture the reality of living in different parts of the country, which is uniquely American because the landscape of America is so diverse because it's such a large uh, land mass country. So people like Williams D Dean Howells and Henry James, they all, they sort of had this belief that it would um, democratize America, you know, everyone's reality. But you had people like Frank Norris, he's the one that said when he pleads for romantic fiction, he says that realism is the, I think it's the tragedy of a broken teacup. Um, William Dean Howells is not as popular in modern America as people like Henry James. Henry James is still read, even though we probably wouldn't pick it up and read it on the beach. He's never been out of publication, actually, uh, since he was writing in the 1890s, the 1880s. So it's interesting that Frank Norris's uh, example that you had to read this past week was in defense of romantic fiction because he argues in his essay that romantic fiction, the stuff like the Scarlet Letter, the stuff that was being written before and during the Civil War has gotten a bad reputation as being um, maudlin, cheesy, over the top um, with, you know, heroines who fall in love, but that's not what uh, romance ever was romance was more of uh, symbolism and impressionism. Um, and that's where I want to take us back to the mystery, a mystery of heroism, which you read the week before last. Mystery of heroism is about a boy who is a soldier 
and he feels that he is being made fun of or ridiculed um, by the other soldiers. And so he accepts this dare and he goes to get the water. But when I had you do that close reading analysis, I was looking at that particular scene of the men uh, standing and looking at the carnage before them and the horses with their gaze up to heaven uh, because they don't understand this human war and the white uh, legs uh, who, that are at one point um, perpendicular to the ground and then they are uh, horizontal. It's not about the people, it's about the white legs. These are all impressions. It's a way of describing what is being seen. The men stand before the battlefield like a swirling angry ocean that they don't understand. Um, the use of the similes. This is about how um, it makes you feel. There's a sense with the descriptive writing of Stephen Crane, this you had to be there. And that becomes what people like Frank Norris are trying to, they're trying to capitalize on or promote that realism like William Dean Howes is doing, was all the description of boring daily life, the tragedy of a teacup. He is arguing for a realism that expresses what it was like. And that is a form of reality too. When you say to someone, you had to be there, that is a form of reality. And so this takes us to a couple of readings that we're going to be doing for the next few weeks. You notice that um, you also had to read um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And she is someone we're going to read in a couple of weeks too. These new realists, which are called naturalists, that's, a, that's something that you had to read about two weeks ago too. The naturalists are more concerned with the impression of things, but they also were interested in classes that were not, you know, the wealthy white elite. But back to Henry James, we're going to be reading a novel called, or it's a novella because it's so short. It won't seem short, it won't seem short to you, but it's considered a novella um, called The Turn of the Screw. And Henry James is of that school that you had to be there. He's concerned with what things seem like to the people experiencing them, those characters, what did it seem like to them? Not necessarily what it is. So when we read The Turn of the Screw, we are going to be questioning reality because when someone tells you a story in real life, you're getting their point of view and you're trusting their point of view, but you also may question if that's really what happened. Um, I have a I have a daughter in middle school and she'll tell us about, you know, this horrible thing the teacher did. And we're thinking, well, we're teachers. Did the teacher really do that? And if we ask the teacher about this exact event that our daughter is describing to us, would she say that that's what happened? Because both of them are describing real life events that happened, but they're from a point of view. And this is where the realism that William Dean Howells was promoting fails because everything is from a point of view. So this week, you're going to be reading, you're going to start the turn of the screw. And I, I, I'm going to put prefatory material to that somewhere else. But I do want you to be thinking about as you read this about that notion of basically of a narrator. When someone tells you a story and you are getting their version of events, they are narrating an event to you and you are deciding whether or not you trust that narrator, how reliable that narrator is. In the case of uh, the turn of the screw, we're going to have a narrator and we're going to have to decide is that narrator's version of events reliable because that narrator's version of events, that's all we have. Um, yeah, but we can try to interpret what's really happening by what she describes, just like when my daughter describes what the teacher did. I'm trying to think, what did the teacher really do that my daughter's interpreting as, you know, she got called out or something happened. Okay, so 
I'm going to stop this and then and we're going to move on to this week.